our time together. Uh, good evening. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Dennis Sasso, uh, Rabbi of Congregation Beth El Tzedek, and uh, I have the pleasure and honor of hosting uh, this evening's conversation with Ron Klein. Uh, to my right is my technical assistant and spiritual advisor, <laughs> Rabbi Sandy Sasso. Uh, Many of you have met Ron and more of you know about Ron, but let me just give you a few biographical notes. Ron graduated from North Central High School, received his BA from Georgetown University and his JD uh, from Harvard Law School. In 1994, he became Chief of Staff and Counselor to Attorney General Janet Reno, and in 1995, Assistant to the President and Chief of Staff to Al Gore. Uh, Ron served as Chief of Staff to Vice President Joe Biden, the same role in which he had served for Vice President Gore. On October 17th of 2014, Ron was appointed the Ebola Response Coordinator, or less officially, the Ebola Czar. And under his role, Ebola cases decreased in Africa and were reduced to zero in America. Since leaving the previous administration, Ron has worked as an external advisor to the Skoll Foundation Global Threats Fund and is Executive Vice President and General Counsel at the investment firm Revolution LLC. Now Ron and his wife Monica have three children, Hannah, Michael, and Daniel. Uh, he grew up in Indianapolis, as you know by now, became bar mitzvah at Congregation Beth El Tzedek twice, as you know by now, and he is the son of our dear member and friend Saran Warner and the late Stanley Klein. So Ran and the family, uh, we are thrilled to have Ron uh, and all of you, I am sure, online tonight. Well, Ron, welcome to our homes at Beth El Tzedek, Indianapolis, uh, uh, to address uh, this, uh, your home base, kind of a parlor meeting conversation that we are having tonight. And the first thing I'd like to ask you is to tell us simply and briefly, we'll dig into uh, particulars later, what is it that you would want for us to understand about the present situation? What do we need to know? What do we need to do? And what should we expect moving forward? Well, first of all, thank you, Rabbi uh, Dennis, Rabbi Sandy, for having me. And it's uh, always a pleasure to see old friends and family. Uh, it'd be more of a pleasure to see everyone in person than this way, but. Uh, but it's great to uh, talk to all of you about this. Look, I think that what we need to know, sadly, is that this is gonna get much worse before it gets better. Uh, 14 days ago, we had had fewer than 100 deaths in the United States. Just 14 days later, the number's at 6,000. And 14 days from now, the number will probably be over 30,000. So we're really just, as much as it seems like this has been with us for a while, and it's just very overwhelming, uh, it's really going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Uh, there's all kinds of speculation about how much worse it will ultimately get and what the final case counts will be and what the peak dates will be. But I think the most important thing for people to know is you listen to all these numbers spinning around and all these projections and models and experts is that this isn't like the weather or a hurricane. It's not a natural event only. We are going to change what happens by our own actions. And that's the most important thing to know. This is a, a, a horrible natural event. That part of it is from nature, but the outcome is shaped by human beings. And it's shaped by us in two ways. First, by how successfully and effectively our government intervenes. Do we put the right policies and measures in place as a country to get people tested, to get hospitals the equipment they need, to get doctors and nurses the gear they need, and all these things that the government has to do. But we as individuals have a big part to play too. Uh, and that means mostly uh, staying at home as much as possible, any way you can, uh, having as little contact with people outside your home as possible. Uh, yes, you can go to the grocery store, you can go to the drugstore, drug store, uh, but do it as little as possible. The less contact we have, the less this disease will spread. That's in our control. And then while we're at home, as we touch and interact with things, wash our hands frequently, uh, try to keep surfaces clean, all the kinds of things you've heard said in the news. Our ability to change the outcome here is dramatic. Uh, if you do the math on this, if, if one person infects two to three other persons and 
you go outside and you, you talk to someone, you shake their hand, whatever, you get close to them, you infect that person, they infect two or three other persons. That's 400 cases at the end of the month. We all stay inside and really don't have much interaction with other people. Each one of us maybe, who were, if we were sick, would only create two or three other cases at the end of a month. So I think the most important thing to know is that uh, sadly it's gonna get worse, but we do have the power to change that if our government makes the right choices and if we as individuals make the right choices too. Thank you. I'm gonna pick up on that then with the following question. And throughout this conversation, uh, uh, I, we would like to avoid partisanship. Uh, we are grateful to Republican and Democratic governors and mayors and congressional leaders from both sides of the aisle who are working together uh, for the common good. Um, having said that, uh, I read a piece uh, you wrote in the spring of 2016 um, following the Ebola epidemic, and uh, it was entitled Confronting the Pandemic Threat. And there you anticipated an event, the proportions of which we are now experiencing or beyond. And you proposed various strategies for the next administration to implement whatever that next administration might be to combat such a pandemic. Uh, the White House uh, sometimes speaks about the failed system it inherited. What can you tell us about the level of information and preparedness with which the current administration was entrusted? Well, Rabbi, as you said, this is not a partisan issue. Uh, the virus doesn't really care if you're a Democrat or Republican. There's not a Democratic or Republican way to fight an epidemic. And all across the country, Democratic and Republican governors are doing uh, good work, uh, including in Indiana, I think. Uh, uh, and Governor DeWine next door has really been a national leader as a Republican. And obviously we all see Governor Cuomo and others on TV every day. So this isn't really a partisan issue. But I do think that there's no getting around the fact that there were failings by the Trump administration here. Um, they uh, didn't heed the warnings they got uh, early on. Uh, during the transition, when they took over, they were warned. Uh, about this pandemic threat. We knew this was coming sooner or later. Uh, President Obama, after the Ebola crisis, had set up an office in the White House to get things ready. President Trump in 2018 took that office apart, disbanded it, and that uh, also hurt our preparations and made cuts at the Centers for Disease Control, which are also supposed to look out for it. And when the early warnings came in from China, largely those warnings were ignored. We didn't take uh, steps quickly enough to get ready. Uh, you know, the good news was that we had time we knew this was coming in January of 2020 from what was happening in China, and yet we didn't use that time to do the things we needed to do, to get our testing systems ready, to get our healthcare system ready, to get the equipment made. But look, all that's in the past now, and the real question is what should we be doing today, given where we are now? We'll have plenty of time to look back and fight about this later. I think the most important thing is really thinking about what needs to be done now. And there are some critical things that still can be done, and, and that really starts uh, first and foremost, with the healthcare system. I think it's important for people to understand that when epidemics get very, very bad, the death toll isn't just from the epidemic itself, but from a collapse of the healthcare system. If you think about it, if the hospitals are filled up with coronavirus patients, and the ICUs are filled up with coronavirus patients, that means not only are those patients at risk, but people with other medical conditions can't get treatment. People with other medical crises can't get treatment, or that treatment's compromised by the widespread infection of these diseases in the hospital. Um, and of course, the other thing that happens very sadly in these epidemics is that healthcare workers, doctors and nurses are the most likely victims. We saw our first death of an emergency room doctor uh, yesterday, uh, and we're gonna see sadly more of those. And that's obviously a tragedy in and of itself, but it also means that the time we need as many doctors and nurses on the job as possible more and more of them get sick, and the capacity of our system to respond goes down. So that's a horrible negative paradox. So what that means is our first focus right now, as this crisis begins to ramp up, as it starts to get much worse, is trying to protect the healthcare system so it can treat as many patients as possible, as successfully as possible. And that means getting our doctors and nurses the gear they need to be safe, the, the right kinds of masks to protect them from inhaling the virus, face shields, uh, uh, protective gowns, protective gloves, all that kinds of equipment we're seeing, we really need to get those things in place right now. In a lot of places, we're gonna need to build emergency hospital beds. We're seeing this on TV in New York, tents in Central Park, 
temporary hospitals in the ja temporary hospital beds in the Javits Center. That's going to be true all over the country. That's even going to be true in Indianapolis, Indiana. We're going to need to increase the number of beds, the amount of capacity for that. And that's the first job. And then the second still urgent job is to fix the system of testing people. We, we are way behind other developed nations in testing, in the rate of testing. Uh, South Korea had its first case the same day we had our first case. And yet within four weeks of that, they had tested 4,000 people out of every million. We had tested only 100 out of every million. Testing is really important because in the end, you can't really separate the sick from the well. You can't get the help you need to the people you need it unless you're testing for that. So those kinds of things, uh, the equipment things like getting enough ventilators in place, getting our doctors and nurses ready to treat the disease, those are the really urgent tasks. Now that's what we really need to be focused on right now. Um, could you, in that line, uh, comment on some of the fiscal um, initiatives that uh, are being taken uh, most recently? Uh, uh, the fiscal responses that are being rolled out to protect employers and employees, uh, the retired and the unemployed. Um, they seem to be well received. Do you have a, a thought on these? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, obviously this public health crisis has become an economic crisis too. We've shut down virtually every business in the country, uh, put a lot of people out of work today, six, the largest number of weekly unemployment claims ever in American history. Six million people. If you want to think about it this way, obviously we were a smaller country during the Great Depression, but it took two years of the Great Depression before 10 million Americans had lost their jobs. We've had that number of people lose their jobs in two weeks of this crisis. Okay? So the economic consequences are real. Congress has acted very quickly with a number of measures. The most significant one, a $2 trillion package uh, being passed and signed into law last Friday. That's gonna send most people a $1,200 check, uh, which will certainly help them uh, to some extent at least. It expands unemployment insurance for those people who lose their jobs. People will be, it will be easier to get unemployment. It will last longer and the checks will be larger, an extra $600 a month. And there'll be small business loans that are supposed to start being open for application tomorrow. Uh, the Secretary of Treasury announced tonight they're gonna to start to take applications tomorrow, hopefully, They'll move fast. It's a vast program uh, that will basically allow employers to borrow um, two and a half times their monthly payroll uh, to help uh, cover paying workers uh, to keep them on the payroll and pay their rent and utilities and basic expenses. So that's a, that's a very large and important program that starts tomorrow. So we're going to need probably more help than that. Congress is talking about doing more uh, in April or May. Uh, this is, I think, just a down payment on what we're going to need. This is going to be a real catastrophic economic event, uh, and it's probably one that's going to be with us for a while. You talked earlier about uh, governors and mayors from both parties uh, who have had to assume primary roles for their states and cities in responding to COVID-19. Would you single out any of those officials as models of leadership, and what are some of the significant steps that they may have taken that have proven particularly effective. And a related issue uh, is how do we respond to the competition for medical resources by, by the states? So two things on that. One, I'd say that, um, uh, you know, the critical issue has been how quickly various governors have moved to enact these stay at home orders, shut down, lockdown, whatever you want to call it, the directive that people are largely supposed to stay at home. Uh, I saw a model last night that showed that for every one day earlier, if we'd done that one day earlier as a country, if you imagine you add up all 50 states and you move those orders one day sooner, you save 10,000 lives. You move it a week sooner, uh, you save a, a 50 to 60,000 lives. And so, uh, you know, I think the governors who did the best were the ones who moved the fastest. Uh, because the sooner you move, the more lives you save. Uh, I talked about this before, how kind of exponentially the virus transmits. Uh, every day made a huge difference. And so I think the governors who acted quickly, uh, people like Governor DeWine in Ohio, Governor Cuomo in New York, Governor Whitmer uh, in uh, Michigan, uh, Governor Newsom in, in California, uh, they deserve a lot of credit for that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the 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 
this, this is going to be with us for a while. And the need for these medical supplies you talked about, Rabbi, is going to be with us for a while. And I do think it would be better uh, if instead of having the states compete against one another to get these supplies, we had kind of a nationalization of the supply chain. That's what we did during the Ebola epidemic. We took over the supply chain. Uh, we ran it out of Washington. And we made sure that the protective gear went to the places that needed it most urgently. In that case, some of that gear had to go to Africa to fight the disease there. Some of that had to go to cities in America where we knew there would be cases of Ebola. And, uh, and we you know, made sure that the right gear was made and it got to the right place. I think having 50 states compete against one another for this gear is unfortunate. I think it's leading to both uh, an inability to get the right things to the right places and also some price gouging about the price of this as well. So. Uh, you know, I, I generally think our, you know, capitalist system works very, very well uh, in a lot of things. But I think in, in this kind of situation, having some central control and some central allocation of resources would be better for all of us. Yeah. Unemployment is obviously going to grow. And uh, there are some very important needs that our country is facing in terms of uh, public works. Uh, what is the advisability and the probability of a public works program for U.S. infrastructure for the unemployed? Yeah, so I think people are just starting to talk about that now. And when people talk about Congress doing something beyond what they've done already, uh, there's a lot of conversation about uh, an infrastructure program, perhaps even one with an environmental focus, building more windmills, more solar panels, uh, more electricity grids, things to both uh, build back the country and build it back even better than it was. Um, I think all these ideas are good ideas, and we're going to need a whole bunch of them. But I think it's also important to be realistic about how quickly that will happen. Uh, we're in this mess for a while now. Uh, I think it's important to understand that um, when you hear on TV that the peak in a particular area will be in late April or early May or whatever you're hearing about where the peak is going to be, um, you know, the peak is the peak. doesn't mean that the day after the peak things are over. In fact, the day after the peak is the second worst day of the epidemic. And it's probably four or five weeks after the peak before some activity can resume. So, uh, you know, I think, I think we should be thinking now hard about the questions you asked, Rabbi, about what happens once we can all go back to work and start to build things again. But we have to understand that's not really going to happen very soon. Um, the important thing, as we both uh, concur, is, is moving forward. And here is a delicate question. It sometimes appears from the press conferences uh, that the president and his scientific advisors are not always of one mind. Uh, we have recently heard that uh, Dr. Fauci's uh, life has been threatened. Uh, can you comment on the immense political pressures which could influence a president to tilt toward science or toward more popular, popular palatable solutions? Yeah, look, it's a hard situation. And I had the great honor of working very closely with Dr. Fauci uh, during the Ebola response, uh, here in my office, I have a signed letter from Dr. Fauci hanging on a wall here because uh, it was a great honor to work with him. And a lot of the folks at the Centers for Disease Control are the same people I worked with back then. Dr. Shukat is the deputy director there. You've seen it. Some of the briefings is one of those officials as well. And so we have great scientists and great experts in our government. They are literally the world's best. Literally, when they have any kind of problem like this around the world, people pick up the phone and they call our experts at the National Institutes of Health, National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control. And so the best thing any president can do is what President Obama did, and what I hope President Trump will do more of, which is listen to these amazing experts who devoted their lives and careers to science and to public service, because they're, they, they know what they're doing. They're going to do the most to keep us safe. And I think that's really ultimately not just what's best for public safety. I also think it's what's best for the economy. Reopening things too soon and having people go into stores and restaurants and get sick from that experience, not only will take lives, it will further undermine people's confidence in the economy. It will further undermine people's confidence that we can go back to normal. And so this is one case where playing it a little safe is the best thing to do, not just to keep us healthy and safe, but also to let people know that when it, we do start to reopen things, things can be reopened safely. This is not a, not a time to rush it or take chances. Would you venture a word about how the coronavirus pandemic um, 
has affected the electoral process, particularly uh, the race in the Democratic Party? How would you assess the impact of the crisis on the political life of our nation moving forward? Well, I mean, let's start with the fact that we're doing a lot less voting than we're supposed to be doing in April and May. Primaries all over the country have been postponed. Um, we, we uh, you know, should be having primaries every week at this time of the year, and we're not. Uh, some states have moved them back to later in May. Some states have moved them to June. It's not even clear that that's going to be possible. Um, and while I do think that the virus will abate over the summer, we can talk about why. I think it's less about seasonality and more about trends. The odds are high that it will come back in the fall. We may have to face, we may, may have to face a general election uh, with the coronavirus threat hanging in the air. And so that's why I think it's important to really have a widespread, easily available nationwide vote by mail. Uh, the one way we know we can conduct elections safely is from the comfort of your home by filling out a ballot and dropping it in a mailbox. Uh, that's something we can all do to protect democracy, to allow us to have elections and to also be safe. Uh, remember when we vote, the challenge isn't just to the safety of going to the polling places. That can probably be managed by people being spread out and wiping down voting machines. You also need poll workers. Uh, and uh, those poll workers have to sit there, they have to interact with lots of people, and that's a challenge. And there are ways to keep them safe, but, I, but it'll also be hard to find people who will want to do that work if people don't feel it's safe. So uh, we don't really know what we're going to be looking at in November. We don't really know what the situation with the virus will be in November. What we do know is that we can run elections safely and easily by having people vote by mail. Uh, that's going to require some work. Voting by mail is a would need special equipment to open and tally the ballots. You need to get the ballots all printed up and mailed out and mailed back and all these things. So hopefully in every state, people will start to work on that now. So there's a fail safe, completely safe mechanism, backup mechanism, if we're uh, in a difficult situation come November. Well, crisis situations can bring out the best in people and they can bring out the worst in people. We have seen examples of uh, altruism, uh, and the dedication in many spheres of our community. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you, Sandy, and I were reflecting on the history of discrimination and scapegoating during our phone conversation. Uh, so this uh, uh, discrimination and scapegoating that often accompanies crisis situations. And we Jews know that history well. Um, we Jews have not as been victimized this season uh, as uh, we have in other times. But presently, there have been some efforts to target uh, Chinese and Asian populations, immigrants, uh, refugees. Could you talk to us as a Jew and as an American about blame, prejudice, and scapegoating? Yeah, I think one thing, when you, as you mentioned, Robbie, when you study the history of epidemics, what you find is throughout history, very often Jews have been blamed for epidemics. This was particularly prevalent uh, during the, the, the Black Plague, uh, the Black Death in Europe in the Middle Ages, uh, the single worst epidemic in world history that we're aware of. Uh, maybe a, as many as a third of all people on planet Earth were killed by it. And throughout Europe, uh, Jews were blamed for the transmission of that disease. And that's been true in epidemic after epidemic after epidemic. Uh, the scapegoating of Jews uh, in particular for the spread of that disease. Uh, obviously, part of that's just latent and historical anti-Semitism. Part of the fact is that uh, Jews, uh, you know, quickly uh, travel around a lot in, in terms of the kinds of professions they had in Europe. Uh, but for whatever reason, we've always uh, kind of been the victims of uh, epidemic-related uh, hatred uh, and violence. Uh, you know, in this current epidemic, it's the Chinese American community that's really bearing the brunt of it here in the United States. Uh, let's be clear, uh, Chinese Americans did not bring this disease to our country. Uh, some travelers coming back from China did. Those are more likely to be actually Americans than Chinese people. Uh, people brought it to the East Coast, largely coming from Europe, who went for trips in Europe in January and February. Uh, blaming the Chinese Americans for this is false and wrong. They're no more likely to have the disease. They're no more likely to spread the disease. They're no more likely to be are responsible for the disease than any other group of Americans. And yet we've already seen Chinese Americans face hate crimes, face uh, children, face bullying in school, even some violent attacks on them. And so I think 
as Jews, given that we are most often the ones who bear the brunt of this kind of discrimination around these epidemics, it's really important for us to raise our voices against this kind of discrimination and to make sure that um, we really uh, are speaking out and speaking up against that kind of discrimination and hatred. And one other thing I'd say along the same lines is the epidemic, the pandemic affects all of us. Every person, no matter whether you are rich or poor, the color of your skin, we're all at risk of this. So that's a, it's a universal event. But its impact affects all of us differently. Those of us with good access to health care know that if we get sick, we'll hopefully get the very best care. Uh, those of us who have bigger savings accounts know that we can afford to be off work and pay our bills and so on and so forth. So it's a time to think about how this will affect the least among us. Uh, you know, homeless people in particular are at risk. Uh, poor people, as you said, immigrants uh, are really concerned about the impact on them. We're seeing now kind of record lines at, at, at soup kitchens and at food relief centers and at, at feeding centers. And so to the extent that we can be generous at this time, and I know a lot of people are, I just hear enormous, amazing stories about people donating supplies and goods and money, like whatever we can do to help people now, it is a time for us to be a generous community because it really is a time when there are a lot of people in need. We have experienced that uh, spirit of generosity in uh, talking with members of the congregation and the community and uh, are gonna continue to explore ways in which at a time of social distancing, we might be able yet uh, to respond to those needs uh, when the uh, least among us are hit the hardest uh, in situations like this. I'd like to uh, see if there are any questions. I have a couple of more questions for you that I would like to save for the end of the conversation, okay. but I'm wondering if any of the uh, participants, the viewers have some questions that they would like to. Uh... Just tell them to. If you have a question, you just need to write it in the chat box. Okay. No, not you, Dennis. Not me. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> while people think and, and people write, um, you have nephews and nieces, uh, you have your own children uh, back home. Uh, there are young Jewish people and American youth of many, many different uh, faiths and cultures and traditions. What advice do you have for our young people at this time, for American youth who are experiencing this unprecedented, novel, critical and unsettling situation, the likes of which neither their parents nor their grandparents ever experienced? What, what, how how should, we, should we be communicating, educating and engaging our young people? Well, first of all, um... I need to do the math on this. Uh, probably no one's grandparents have experienced this, but people's great grandparents yes. have experienced this. And I think it's really um, important to remember that as dramatic as this is, this is not the first time we as a country have experienced this. Uh, in 1918, we had the Spanish flu. And uh, the Spanish flu was actually much worse than this. Uh, it's the single largest mass casualty event in American history. Um, uh, what can we, uh, you know, and so we need to learn uh, from that in terms of the fact that um, more people died from the Spanish flu than World War I and World War II combined. And I think that, um, uh, you know, uh, 600,000 dead in, in two years. And uh, obviously it was devastating and horrible, but uh, what I would say to young people is that uh, we lived through that and uh, we, uh, you know, were able to recover from that as a country. Uh, this will pass. We will get through it. So that's the first message I'd have to them. There's history behind this and the history says we can overcome and we can recover. The second thing is it's really important for young people to observe the social distancing rules. I think we all saw that, um, you know, these pictures of young people on spring break in Florida and Mexico and other places and, and young people feel like they're invulnerable. Young people feel like, you know, I'm healthy, nothing bad can happen to me. And I'd say two things about that. First of all, uh, though it is more rare young people can get sick from this disease. It definitely hits elderly more severely than young people, but sadly there have been young victims of this disease. And, um, and that's really uh, important to remember. But more importantly, what I would say is, if you're a young person, even if you think you're invulnerable, you think nothing bad can happen to you, you can transmit this disease to other people. And so even if you yourself aren't going to get sick, 
Think about friends and family and even strangers, frankly, who you could pass this disease on to. So it's important for young people to observe the social distancing rules. And then the last thing I'd say, and, I, 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 and, and I'm not a young person, but I chastise myself on this, is we all need to do a better job of staying in touch with our relatives and our loved ones. Uh, so uh, I owe my mother more phone calls than I'm giving her, and everyone owes their parents more phone calls than they're giving them. Um, it's a hard time to be alone, and particularly a lot of our elderly people live alone and don't get to see family and are more isolated than ever, and it's a very, very, very hard time. And, and the, the, you know, older people have more trouble using technology platforms to connect with people, and so whatever we can do to kind of reach out and stay connected it's just really, really important. This is gonna be a long and nerve wracking period and we uh, need to try to stay connected to one another. We're getting some questions now and perhaps right. more than we can handle, but here, here's a one from Claudette Einhorn. Why is this pandemic at risk of recur reoccurring when others uh, do not? So uh, 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 others in fact do. And in fact, in the Spanish flu, which I mentioned before, it was the second wave that was worse than the first wave. So the Spanish flu first hit in 1918, that was bad, but actually killed far more people when it came back in 1919. Hmm. So recurrence of pandemics is a, is a common thing. In fact, what I say is a little bit encouraging this time is that it seems that the virus, the coronavirus that causes it is not mutating. So I think that um, we are less likely to see a severe recurrence. Hmm. One thing I say, Rabbi, is, that when we see on TV, we see these curves. You know, the people say, what's gonna happen with the disease? And you see a curve and it looks like some kind of parabola you drew in high school geometry class. It goes up and it comes down. In fact, unfortunately, what we're gonna see is a bunch of hills. So it will come up, it'll come down. In a couple of months, it'll kind of come back again, go down again, come back and go down again. It's gonna be like that until we have a widespread available vaccine. It won't be as bad when it comes back the second time, probably won't be as bad when it comes back a third time, but we're gonna have these periodic flare-ups where maybe particular places, not the whole country again, but particular places have to shut down again, particular flare-ups in cases. We're gonna see that until probably sometime in the summer of 2021, when we have a widely available vaccine. That's the only thing that's gonna finally put it to rest. So between now and then, a lot of hills uh, on, the, on the road from here to finality. Uh, Bob Smith uh, is asking a, a humane question that you work with many anchors and journalists. How are they doing with this crisis? It must be so emotional for them, uh, much more than uh, for many others, as much as anyone. Yeah, I think that, uh, look, this affects all of us. And I think that um, uh, if, sadly, if you don't yet know someone who has the virus, you probably soon will. And uh, that's true, obviously, a lot for a lot of journalists who travel around the world a lot and have very broad networks. And those of you who uh, watch this know that uh, Chris Cuomo, whose show I often appear on, uh, has the virus himself right now. Uh, and it uh, seems like he's doing very, very well. Uh, I'm a lawyer, as you mentioned, Rabbi, and there's a very prominent legal journalist named David Latt, who I know, who uh, was in the hospital. And this is a good example of why it's not just old people. David Latt's probably in his early 40s. He was in the hospital with coronavirus. Every day he was posting pictures of how well he was doing. One day the pictures didn't come and it was because he was on a ventilator. He had to be intubated. Uh, now, fortunately, he's recovered and he's on his way out. But I think uh, this is hitting everybody. Uh, you know, obviously we heard first about the famous people who got it, uh, Tom Hanks and Prince Charles and whatnot. But uh, this is, this is going to be something that we're all going to know people who are victimized by it and are going to have to deal with it. Someone wants to know if it is realistic that the stay-at-home orders will be lifted by the fall of 2020, Barry Levitt. Yeah, I think it is. I think that, in fact, I think sooner than that, we will see a resumption of activity. I think what's important to think about, about this question is we tend to think about this a little bit like it's an on-off switch. Right now, the switch is off, and someday people will flip the switch back to on. Instead, we need to think about it more like a dimmer switch. Right now, the setting is very low, and over the course of the summer, we'll start to dial the setting back up. So, you know, first thing is we'll be able to go, people who work in offices, we'll be able to go back to offices, but separated, you know, like the desks further apart, maybe, people taking more an effort to clean surfaces and whatnot. And then other stores will start to open, and then more and more things will come open. We were talking before we started about what the High Holy Days might look like, and 
we might well be able to have live services at High Holy Days, but people might have to sit, you know, with empty seats between them and a little more distance. And, you know, one of the best things about the Holy Days is coming into temple and hugging and shaking hands with old friends. We might have to not do those things. And so I think one thing to think about is not just when this current period of confinement ends, but what we will be doing as a country, as a people, after it ends. It won't just go back to the way it was. We're going to have to be more careful about things. We're going to have to do things more gradually. Uh, for example, factories may open, but they may make the workers stay farther apart. We may produce less things that way. I, I talk all the time to people in the restaurant industry who are already thinking about reopening, but taking out half the tables so people are farther apart in a restaurant. So life will start to go back to normal over the summer, but post-COVID normal won't look like what pre-COVID normal looked like. Things will be different for, uh, for some time after that. Cultural and social um, reorganization. Um, Stuart Fox um, makes the comment that uh, it appears as a result of this pandemic that some uh, groups at conflict, at war with one another, are uh, laying down their arms or at least uh, less engaged. Can you comment on this? Uh, for example, we've read of cooperation between uh, Palestinians and Israelis uh, to fight this. Um, uh, is it so that uh, we have less conflict, armed conflict, as a result of this worldwide? Yeah, I'd say that um, uh, a, a, a little bit of good news and a little bit of bad news. I think what, what we will see uh, at first, what we've seen at first is a lot of these uh, great uh, heartwarming examples of um, people putting aside conflicts, Democrats and Republicans putting aside their conflicts to pass recovery legislation on a unanimous basis very quickly in Congress is a good example. And, all the heartwarming things we've seen of Palestinians and Jews in Israel working together on different recovery efforts. And hopefully that will continue. I will say there is a risk that as things get more dire in a place, as resources get squeezed, sometimes those exacerbate conflicts. And so we've seen that in various parts of the world in earlier epidemics that uh, you know, uh, armed conflict results from a battle for scarce resources and from the kinds of dislocation. In some places of the world, food, not in America, but in other places, the world food supplies may get short. You know, this disease, we're obviously very focused on the United States, as we should be. This is where we live. But the disease is now starting to spread in Africa, starting to spread in South America and Latin America. And uh, their healthcare systems obviously are much weaker. The ability to fight it's much weaker. And there uh, could well cause, in addition to healthcare crisis, a security crisis as people battle for scarce resources. Go back to a medical related question from your friend, Jeff Smullyan. Awesome. After we bend the curve, Ron, what do we need to do with testing to limit a significant reoccurrence of the virus? Yeah, it's a great question. So bending the curve, flattening the curve, whatever you want to say we're going to try to do this curve is trying to take that parabola I was talking about a minute ago and push the top of it down. And that means that at the peak, there are fewer cases. That means we're less likely to break the healthcare system. Uh, if we, even if we have almost as many cases, if they're more spread out, the hospitals can take can deal with them. The doctors and nurses can deal with them. We can't deal with a giant crush of cases. So after we do that, what do we what do we have to do on, on testing? What we're going to have to do is really have ubiquitous testing. People are going to be have to be able to go someplace and very quickly be tested. And it's a different kind of testing. Right now, we're testing if people are sick with the kind of swab testing that's going on. We're gonna need what's called serology tests to test for antibodies. We're gonna to need to find out if people were sick. Um, and, and, uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. So that's gonna be a test that right now, Abbott Labs, others are pioneering. Hopefully it'll be available in three or four weeks. It will be faster uh, and we'll be able to measure whether or not people have the virus. Now, why is that important? It's important, this is I think implicit in Jeff's question. It's important because uh, we believe and we don't yet know that once you get this disease once, you probably can't get it a second time. This is an unknown fact. It's most common with viruses, has to be proven here. But if that's true, as it often is, then if we know who has had it, and if they know they have immunity, then we feel those people are safe. They can go back to work. Uh, they can go you know, back to all kinds of activities, so on and so forth. The only way to know that, though, is to test people for the presence of the antibodies and also to confirm that, in fact, once you have it, you have immunity going forward. We talked about uh, 
governors earlier and uh, Todd Maurer is asking, are governors reluctant to order or some governors reluctant to order shelter in place for political reason and fear of not getting reelected or do they really believe that shelter in place is not necessary? Well, look, we're, we're at this point in time, uh, I think 43 of the 50 states have these orders in place. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I'm not going to uh, kind of despair anyone's motives as to why they move sooner or later. But I think that there's no question that sooner uh, was important. Um, and uh, I think there were a lot of reasons for the states that moved later. I think some of them thought their state somehow wouldn't be affected. They thought somehow this was just going to be a kind of a, a densely packed state phenomenon. Maybe they thought this was just going to be an, an East Coast, West Coast phenomenon. Uh, but I think, um, uh, again, the governors that moved most quickly uh, will be the ones who will come out of this looking uh, the best, whose states will have the best fate. In fact, you can already see uh, states, uh, the difference between Kentucky and uh, Tennessee on this, where Kentucky moved much more quickly than Tennessee, is already quite dramatic in terms of the number of cases in Kentucky, the number of cases of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, there'll be a reckoning on this after. This isn't the time for the reckoning right now, I think, on that, but there will be a time for a reckoning on this after, and we'll have to look at who moved promptly and who moved slowly. Uh, Kevin Krulovich, uh, Ron, you talked a little about our need to be doing more testing. Uh, tonight, Vice President Pence said costs of testament, testing and treatment will be covered for all Americans. However, there is no place for non-emergency personnel to get a test. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, hello, Kevin. Good to, good to hear from you. Um, uh, yes, the law that Congress passed in mid-March guarantees that all testing should be covered. And yes, there are more tests available now than there were. But still, it's very, very hard to find tests. Uh, and also hard to get your test results back quickly. The most often thing I hear from the front lines are people in hospitals who have been tested, who are waiting days to get a result uh, because of the overload of the labs and processing these tests. So we're a long way from having the kind of testing system we need in our country to have people um, be able to know if they have or had the virus or not. Uh, hopefully uh, that will speed up, uh, but certainly it's a, it's a critical need for our country. We're getting a lot of uh, medical questions. Uh, you have uh -oh. a degree in medicine as well? <laughs> uh, I do not, but, I, but uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> well, this comes from a prominent uh, physician, uh, Myron Weinberger, I presume. Uh, he says, Ron, during the Ebola crisis, convalescent plasma from survivors was used to treat some acute patients. A similar approach has been suggested for COVID-19. What are the limitations and risks that need to be considered? Yeah, it's a great question, Dr. Weinberger. Hope you're doing well. Um, what, what, I'd, what I'd say is this was one of many approaches we used during Ebola. And, you know, it, it's important. There are lessons from Ebola. There are obviously differences. Uh, one difference was that when we started in October 2014, Ebola had a 70% mortality rate. Uh, so, uh, you know, COVID, as bad as it is, probably has a 1%, 2 3% mortality rate. So because of that, we threw everything, including the kitchen sink at all these Ebola patients. We did whatever we could to try to save their lives. And one of those things was taking the blood from people who had recovered from Ebola and giving it to Ebola patients. Um, we also threw a lot of different drugs at these people to see what worked. And because we were just working so fast and in real time against such a crisis, a lot, we didn't really conduct the kind of clinical studies that would let you know exactly what, of all these things we were doing, which of those things were really saving people's lives. We used convalescent blood. We used uh, a couple of uh, antiviral medicines. Uh, we, we used uh, a, a drug that was manufactured from tobacco leaves called ZMAP. Uh, we kind of threw everything at these people to try to save their lives. Uh, there has been some use of convalescent blood uh, in the case of coronavirus. People are starting to experiment with that. They're starting to also experiment with some of the same drugs we used uh, with Ebola, uh, antiviral called remsedemsevir. Uh, flavipavir is another one that's also being given to people. Uh, I think we'll know in a few weeks which of these things are effective. Uh, I think it's important. We hear a lot of stuff about medical developments. It's important to, for the people who are not like Dr. Weinberger, who are not uh, experienced physicians, to understand there's two different kinds of things we're talking about. 
What are therapeutics? Things that help people when they get sick. Those are certainly important. You know, if someone's in the hospital, we obviously want them to survive. That's important. But those things don't stop the spread of the disease. They just help people who, once they get sick, recover from the disease. Those things will be available, I think, relatively soon. I think in four or five, six weeks, we're going to have a couple of ways to reduce the death rate from coronavirus. What we really need to do is stop people from getting sick. And that takes a vaccine. And the vaccine is going to take a lot longer. Now, why is it going to take a lot longer? Well, first of all, it has to be built from scratch. I said a second ago for Ebola, we were throwing everything at these patients, things we had, the same things going on with coronavirus. We're taking existing drugs and trying to see if it helps people. But a vaccine to work needs to be uh, built from scratch. And so uh, doctors and scientists just started building it uh, in January. They're working at record pace. We'll probably have some, we have some being tested already. It takes a few months to test them. And then it takes even longer to make them. Making 300 million doses of vaccine is not an easy project. And it will take months and months to do that and distribute it to people. So I don't think we're gonna see a vaccine until the summer of 2021. So we'll have drugs to treat sick people first, vaccines to prevent infections much later. A question from our neighbor and friend, uh, Marsha Goldstone, whom you know from her role with the JCRC uh, as director some years ago. Marsha asks, can you comment? Federal guidelines were so late in coming, as we all know, States have lots of independent authority to set their own restrictions. Do you see any way, given the structure of our government, that the national organizations, the CDC, the HHS, can develop a closer relationship to the state health department so that we don't have such a disastrous lag time and so many different sets of responses? Well, it's a great question, Marcia. And there's two things to think about here, which is, uh, how the national authorities can lead and then how they can make the states follow. And so here, I think we did have a letdown of our national health care leaders in not issuing clear guidance. The Centers for Disease Control and the White House should have much earlier been crisper and clearer on what we needed to do and, and urged everyone to um, go to these shutdown orders, to go to social distancing, all these things we're doing now, that guidance should have come from Washington. It should have been clearer should have been firmer. Uh, now, in the end, we live in a country that is a, has a federalist system. And in the end, the power to actually shut things down, the power to issue these orders rests with governors. That's our system, you know, and that's not going to change. And so the, this works best when Washington and the national authorities issue clear guidance and then encourage the governors to follow. That's what we did with Ebola on issues like travel and monitoring of suspected patients. We issued a firm national guidance out of Washington, and then we got on the phone and tried to persuade the governors to follow the guidance we were issuing. Uh, ultimately, the governors decide, but if Washington leads, usually the governors follow. There's another governor question, uh, Phil Brennan. Uh, the governor of Georgia today said he only now is preparing to issue a statewide shelter in place order. Only in the last 24 hours, he said, had he learned that people showing no symptoms could spread COVID-19. Assuming Governor Kemp is being truthful, what does, Sorry. <laughs> what does this discovery of old readily available information tell us about where even some people in authority are getting their facts in these polarized times? Well, this is really tempting my vow not to be partisan. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, what I'll, what I'll say that's particularly sad about Governor Kemp's statement uh, that he was unaware that the virus could spread from asymptomatic people is he made it in front of the Georgia State House, which is only 6.5 miles from the headquarters of the Centers for Disease Control. He literally was in walking distance of the epicenter of global knowledge about this pandemic and how someone uh, in Atlanta uh, could not know uh, that uh, with the CDC right there in his backyard that this disease can spread asymptomatically is beyond me. And sadly, uh, people like Governor Kemp, who are late to the late to the situation, are going to see their states pay a price for that. Well, here is a question from a concerned uh, parents, uh, Linda Maurer. 
What do you think about the reality of summer camps happening this summer? Well, I think the reality of that is very, the likelihood of that is very, very low. Uh, you know, I think we'll have some activities in the country resume this summer. I think, uh, you know, offices will probably open this summer. Uh, some businesses will open, maybe even some restaurants in a more uh, structured and ordered way, as I said. But the, the idea that uh, we're going to have these large gatherings of kids uh, living closely together and doing all the things people do at summer camp. I did a summer camp as a boy. I think that is, I think that is very unlikely. And um, I think it's, it, you know, it's, it's possible. You can't say never yet. It's too soon to say never yet. But if I had young children, sadly, I do not. My children are all grown up. Uh, I'd be making other plans for them this summer. Because uh, I just think, uh, you know, given the kind of the way in which camps are unstructured, and it's just, you know, really hard to imagine running a camp with social distancing and having that be an effective a thing you would do at a summer camp. Um, I just think the likelihood that they will open are, are, are low. Yeah. Some summer camps are already doing uh, some uh, virtual activities for children who are out of school now. Yeah. So they are organizing uh, uh, virtual events. I know that a camp where our grandkids went to is having uh, a virtual Passover Seder for the kids and, uh, and Havdalahs and things of that nature. A question yeah, I would have learned much less about poker at virtual summer camp, so I don't know how this <laughs> will work out exactly. You learn less about what? Poker, poker? if we had virtual summer camp, you know, so. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, Gail Halpern, our former executive yeah. director, how reliable is the current testing? Is a negative result a true negative? Yeah, Gail, it's a great question. And so uh, what's really interesting um, about this is that um, the U.S., uses a different test than virtually every other country. So most of the world's countries adopted in January a test put out by the World Health Organization. And one reason why our government uh, rejected that test is that test had what they thought was a um, uh, too high level of false positives. So what that means is that test said people who were sick, said people were sick who weren't really sick. And so we built our own test in America And unfortunately, now the data is coming out that our test has too many false negatives. Uh, in fact, there's a new data out yesterday that some samples of people, um, 40% of the people who got negative results actually had the virus, which is obviously a, a totally unacceptable rate. Now, part of that is because um, to really be tested successfully, you need to be tested twice uh, to catch the virus, make sure they have it. The sampling of this, uh, if you haven't seen it, the swab test is kind of really unpleasant. Uh, uh, the swab has to go all the way up your nose to the very, very back of your throat. It's painful. It's really unpleasant. And, uh, and the success of administering the test is, is kind of very uneven. People have to be really good at it. And of course, as we're rapidly ramping up the testing, people aren't so good at it. And so we're seeing a lot of false negatives. If you need a test, you definitely should get tested twice to make sure that it catches the virus. And again, hopefully soon, in four or five weeks, we'll have more reliable tests, uh, faster blood-related tests, uh, what they call PCR tests, all kinds of other tests that hopefully will uh, more quickly uh, produce more reliable results. I'm ask you one more um, medical question, and then we're going to try to wrap it up, sure. sort of respectful of your time. This comes from past president of our congregation, David Regenstreif. Uh, billions of N95 masks are being shipped overseas, uh, but my daughter, who is an OBGYN, is not allowed to use one in a delivery. Can you comment? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, this whole situation with the masks and other protective gear is just a huge tragedy. Um, we, uh, again, without trying to get partisan about this, we did not Uh, our federal government did not quickly take control of the supply chain, and we have this irony, which is we're begging other countries for supplies, and yet we're still shipping supplies overseas. It seems like complete chaos in that result. Uh, as a result, our healthcare workers, the people who are really on the front lines of this, uh, don't really have uh, masks. They don't have the protective gear they need, and these N95 masks are the most protective kinds of masks, um, and so they're in very, very short supply. As a result, Hospitals and healthcare providers are rationing them. They're only allowing people who are really treating COVID patients to use them. And, 
And that means a lot of people who might have exposures, like people working in the labor, labor and delivery setting who might be delivering a baby to someone who has COVID who doesn't even know it, uh, should be being protected from that, isn't being protected. We really will not have a response to this disease until we solve these supply chain problems, until we're sure that doctors and nurses have the supplies they need, have the gear they need, uh, we really don't have a, a, an effective response in place. Well, uh, a question from uh, Dr. Larry Fallender, and then we will conclude. Uh, different from what we have most uh, been talking about. Do you think this virus is from animals in China or a bioweapon mishap? Yeah, I think there's, there's been a lot of internet speculation about bioweapons and whatnot. There's very little evidence for that and no real reason to think that's what it is. I think the best epidemiology we've done so far suggests that it did indeed come from animals. Um, maybe it came from one of these wet markets where uh, live animals are sold. Uh, maybe it came from some other interaction between people and, and, uh, and, and animals. But I think, it, uh, I think the overwhelming evidence is that, uh, and I think the early studies of the DNA suggest that it came from probably a bat uh, biting a, a pig and someone eating the pig. So, um, uh, you know, I mean, trafe is always trafe, I guess. Uh, but, um, but that certainly seems to be, um, certainly seems to be the best evidence so far. Well, talking about animals, we are soon going to be, uh, uh, reading all about uh, frogs and lice yeah. and locusts yeah. and wild beasts, um, and the ancient, uh, plagues. But there is a profounder uh, message, I think, in the holiday that uh, we had been talking about, and I would like you to reflect as you did with Sandy and me. So let us uh, finish our chat uh, with a brief discussion of Passover in the current context. Ron, how do Passover themes resonate for you at this time? And what practical and hopeful message can you offer us tonight as we observe next week our Festival of Liberation? Of course, following social distancing protocols, even as we yearn to connect with one another and with our wise and beautiful tradition. Talk to us about Passover. Well, you know, Dennis, as we were talking about earlier this week, I mean, in the here and now, it's a very, it's going to be a very sad Passover for a lot of us. Uh, I'm uh, 58 years old. I think every one of my 58 years of life, I've been at my mother's table, my family's table to celebrate this holiday with loved ones. And we'll be doing it on Zoom next week, like a lot of people. And that's, that's, a, that's just a very sad thing to have that kind of separation at this time. That's such a time of family togetherness for Jews uh, all around the world, and obviously in our country too. Um, but I think there are interesting lessons from Passover for this. Uh, if you believe, as some people do, that the plagues that we read about in the Passover story are kind of natural events that have been um, kind of blown up into these plagues, uh, natural events that caused frogs and boils and hail and all these things. Well, the 10th plague is kind of interesting, right? The slaying of the firstborn, if in that interpretation, it was probably some kind of infectious disease. And, uh, and so uh, this, the Exodus is the first example of social distancing. The Jews are instructed on the night of the plague uh, to obviously put blood over their doors, but to stay in their homes. Exodus 12, 22, stay in your homes. So when people say, well, we've never seen one of these stay-at-home orders, there's a stay-at-home order in the Torah uh, in the face of a plague. And um, that reminds us that throughout human history, we've been dealing with these kinds of challenges. Our people have been dealing with these kinds of challenges. And we've overcome. And I think the hopeful message this Passover is that just as the end of our period of confinement in Egypt ended, the end of this period of confinement will come. And we will once again be liberated, and we will once again go out in our communities and see our friends and our families and be able to enjoy the kind of uh, freedom and the kind of celebration that we associate with Passover. So we've overcome this before. We will overcome this again. We will overcome this now. And we will all be celebrating that together at some point in time in the future. Thank you, Rabbi Ron Klein. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. We have uh, a lot of expressions of gratitude in the chat uh, for your presence with us tonight. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for your time and especially for everything that you do for our nation. 
our best wishes to you, to Monica, and to your children and family, and of course, to your mom and Marlo and all the family here as well. Thank you all for listening and participating in this evening's conversation with our very esteemed and gracious guest and friend, Ron Klein. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, Rod. Thank, Thank you, Rod. Rabbi and Ron. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Rabbi. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.